Yes. You are the chair of my committee, Stefan. I'm glad you're taking your duty so seriously. <laughs> yeah, and it's Oleg, Oleg and Ben are the other people. to statistical learning, what is that for? Um, for me, and maybe a course. Um, I took a course by two of the authors from Stanford. In the earlier version of the books, which was higher level, this is actually meant for students, not just for students. I'm going to try and see what it means with the doctor. How are you? Hey, let's go. Good. Yeah. I still don't quite understand exactly what those. I think I've been to one before when you were there. Yeah. I didn't fully understand exactly what we were supposed to be doing. That. Seems like a lot of waste of time. Um, so this one's scheduled from 11 a.m. to 1 p.m. Yeah. And it'll take probably half an hour just to go down the introductions. And then we'll go around the agenda that they gave, which is really not much of an agenda. Um, it's supposed to be where we can talk about getting courses on the same track at different schools so that we have the same course number and the same thing at different schools. But we still haven't got it straight between us and Salt Lake Community College. What, what don't we have straight with uh, One of their courses we have at 3,000 level. <coughs> yeah. And they have yeah, we just had an exception thing well, for I'm about getting, that. And then depending on who the student talks to, sometimes we'll recognize it, other times we won't. And this is the hell out of John. Oh, I know. I, I'm, I'm having lunch tomorrow with John Clinton. Okay. Anybody wants to join me after John's uh, talk? Because he also said something which was very upsetting to me, or disturbing to me, I should say, that um, there are a lot of his students that are. You know, he has a big range of students, but he said a lot of his best students, who he thinks are actually really good students, end up not going to the U, even though in some sense they would want to or be more convenient to them, to go to USU or Weber because um, they come here and, I don't know, but is telling them that, you know, there are 2210 and it doesn't count and they have yes. to take 3210 and yeah. 3220 and all exactly that. That's exactly it. They come here and depending on who they talk to, they get very different answers about what course credit they're allowed to have. Yeah. And so they just, first of all, it's not welcoming and they're like, well, why did I take, you know, so he's, he, he's been in the same, in some situations, you know, he's actually told some of the students just not to take any physics credit. Just get all the gen eds out of the way. Because they're going to take it again. I'm like, okay, we got to stop that. And that's silly. Johnson's an excellent instructor. And when he says someone's good, he really is good. Yeah. So, I mean, we don't, you know, the thing is, you know, he won't always be instructor. And, you know, uh, and so we don't want to uh, take take for granted that somebody who's as conscientious as he's going to be in there. But on the other hand, at the moment, we have to honor that that's. His boss goes to these majors' meetings, and I try to talk to her about this. I did last year before I can't remember the last one I went to. And she's just really Hey John. <laughs> nothing to really say other than talk to someone about it and everything's fine. And then when I asked Jonathan about it, there's nothing changed, nothing done. So he can't even convince his boss that there's I mean I think this asks most of the problem on most of Yeah. But we need to we need to just uh, I mean, I think this, just, just talking with them and getting on the same page is going to be what's needed. You know, we, we just have to be confident that what he's doing with them is, is sufficient. His boss doesn't think that that's a problem. I can't remember the name. I mean, it's kind of, I feel like we should, in some sense, you know, 
if students are good and they take the engineering like course here, they they you know they'll learn the same basically the same material right that they would learn in 3210, 3220. I think the big difference, what I've discovered, is it's the same <coughs> physics topics. The difference is in the is in the level of math. Mm -hmm. So they get they go farther. They get um, they get pushed further in their math in the mm -hmm. in the honor sequence. And so I don't think there's I don't think that they're not covering they're, they're covering the same physics topics by and large. I think that they touch on relativity in the honor sequence, which is not in, not important because they get it in 3740 to a lot yeah, yeah. greater So, what, but I think what is probably a real difference is the math. So we we should still continue to try to get our majors into that. But if they what does 3740 cover exactly? I don't. It's I'm not clear on it. They teach it. It's uh, like three to four weeks of relativity through like the four vector formalism. Okay. And then um, and then. The rest of it is, you know, a little bit of transition, you know, exploring the breakdown of classical okay. physics um, and the need for quantum. It's a little bit of history, and then, and then, you know, kind of introducing quantum mechanics all the way through. You know, I typically just start on like, you know, maybe I touch on Fermi and Bose statistics, or maybe I touch on, um, you know, we, we get through hydrogen, and then maybe we talk talk about molecules. Okay. Just that's just all we can do. I mean, no, I never talk about broadcast notation, but some people do. I mean, I just, I just mostly focus on the wave function mm -hmm. in the quantum part. Yeah. <laughs> all right, <laughs> front and center. <laughs> Yes, it is. I haven't heard, I haven't gotten any, and I sent a message to Charlie and Gordon today to try to advertise that. And it's I, in INSCC Auditorium. I can, I can, or. No, I know, I, I, know, I know what it is, but I don't think anybody, I don't think it's widely known. It's 10, it's 10, uh, 11 a.m. at INSCC Auditorium tomorrow. I, I, so I learned it Gordon and Charlie that you know, and They've been like communicating in the most <laughs> like first they were like, Can we get him in on a heap seminar? And then now they like then they were like writing to Jung because it's now considered a colloquium, right? But like they were about scheduling it and didn't include me and then Jung wrote to me and said, you know, can we find a bigger room? And it's it's just been like I mean it's an important thing for some faculty to know about. Yeah. So it's at the eleven that's a lot more because I have a Catherine uh, should also record it, right? If we're. Yeah. It might be worth. Uh, it's, it's about um, exploring. The possibility of, of uh, the six hire before he leaves for his, because he had mentioned to several of us, and it, it's the the question is really about whether or not uh, whether or not there's some kind of uh, you know he has some interest in making that happen before he goes. So just trying to find out because he had mentioned that to a couple of us during the chair interviews, and that, but that was before we knew he was leaving in a year, so. So we just wanted to find out whether that was a possibility. Yeah, no, of course. It's always a trick. Yeah, I mean, as the, you know, the the I think that the uh, we were all of the, of the understanding that there was going to be one more astronomy higher, but then it's less clear that that's actually ever going to happen, uh, you know, in the, in the kind of context of the original astronomy initiative. But uh, yeah, I, I anyway. She'll film it. I don't know how well documented this is, but it's got to be. Well, it's the thing is that Dave, for the first time ever, for, Dave, for the first time ever, told us some a kind of a different story last time we discussed this with him, which is why we're kind of confused about what the sexual situation.
At some point, I also want to um, talk with you. I'm starting to, I, I'm starting discussions with people at Bryce Canyon uh, about some, this like a nighttime education center. And right now, it's just kind of me and Kevin Poe, the ranger down there, been discussing. I have a scene monitor up down there right now and stuff. But at some point, where I'm supposed to give a presentation to their like full staff at some point, uh, along with Kevin. And so I wanted to kind of talk to you before then. That's going to probably happen at the end of October or something. So, uh, so just to tell you what we're doing down there. Yeah. Yeah. That's how dark the site is. That was going to be my. Yeah, I blown my opening. Uh, it's not actually the telescope. Oh. This this was taken with a camera. Oh, okay. Well, so it's <laughs> just one of the guys in my class last year. Yeah. That's a beautiful Yeah, let's do it. All right. Yeah. Uh, thank you all for uh, for being here. Um, today, I'm really happy to introduce our own Dr. Anil Seth, um, who is an observational astronomer specializing in um, galaxies, stars, um, and the uh, supermassive black holes that reside in their centers, tying these together. Um, Anil uh, was an undergraduate at uh, Wesleyan in central Connecticut, and he took a PhD at the University of Washington in Seattle. The um, subject of his PhD um, research is the formation and evolution of late-type galaxies. And just so I'm clear, a late-type galaxy for the non-astronomers is an object that um, uh, glows brightly in early-type stars. The subsequent path professionally was to move to um, Cambridge, Massachusetts where he became a Center for Astrophysics Fellow at the Harvard-Smithsonian uh, uh, Center for Astrophysics. And at this point in, um, in his career, he uh, zoomed in on a topic separate from the overall evolution of galaxies and um, moved, honed in toward the center to look at the nucleus of, of galaxies, the central regions, um, which uh, host uh, supermassive black holes in um, in many cases, and he spoke about this subject when he first came to Utah uh, to talk to us. And this uh, work on the central regions of black holes um, led to an extremely nice uh, conference um, last uh, winter at a, a Snowbird, the Snowpack Conference, and which Neil organized. And it was a fantastically successful one. Uh, the um, the uh, conference attendees uh, came from countries all around the world, and uh, you might say that the um, sun never set on the, um, the conference attendees, or because they're astronomers, you would say the sun never rises. <laughs> <laughs> so um, the title of the conference was Dynamics, Disruptions, and Demographics. And um, this touched me uh, personally. I, lo I love this, this subject. It was truly fantastic. So it was really excellent that uh, Neil has brought us um, uh, uh, high visibility in this area of research. Um, but today, uh, we'll hear about something uh, different, more in line with the, um, the formation and evolution of late-type galaxies. And I, I really love how um, the subject which was chosen because a lot of uh, astronomical research focuses on understanding the Milky Way. Um, so what better way to learn about our own galaxy than to look at um, the one, our sister next door. So, Anil, please, All right. tell us about it. Thanks. Um, thanks for having me. I'm glad everyone came inside on this beautiful day. Uh, and thanks for the uh, clarifying all the astronomical terms I'm going to use in this talk. <laughs> um, so uh, Andromeda is, for most people, the most distant object that they've ever seen just with their naked eye. Uh, it's, a, it's the nearest, uh, nearest large galaxy to our own. And um, I'm going to be telling you about my research on uh, Andromeda today. 
Um, and as Oh, and this, this picture, it was actually taken by uh, an undergraduate in my uh, observational astronomy course last fall, uh, but I think it's fantastic, and you can see how, how, bright, how dark the uh, skies are at Frisco that you can so clearly see the Hubble Space Telescope uh, <laughs> while it was looking at Andromeda. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm just going to click here. So the... Um, I, as, as Ben mentioned, I kind of have two parallel research topics that are somewhat related, but also somewhat distinct. And so I'm only going to focus on one of those here. Uh, and in particular, I'm going to be talking about work that I've been doing with uh, a, a large group of people, including uh, several undergraduates uh, and post -bac students here, Matt Wallace, Dylan Gregerson, and Jordan Bulkley, um, as well as I have a graduate student who I, I advise at the University of Washington on this project, uh, whose name is Cliff Johnson, who's fantastic. Uh, and of course, there's a big team, as you'll see, uh, behind this project. Um, but also I just wanted to highlight that in my group I also have a postdoc and a graduate student uh, here at, at University of Utah, Mark Denbrock and Yu Nguyen. And I hope that when I come and talk to you guys next time I'll be, or I know that next time when I come and talk to you guys I'll be highlighting their work. Um, so Andromeda. Uh, Andromeda has been a kind of cornerstone object in our understanding of the universe for a long time. Uh, and in particular it was uh, Edwin Hubble, when Edwin Hubble was looking at this in the early part of the 20th century, he was able to see variable stars that, uh, that were just like ones that we could see in the Milky Way, but were much, much, much fainter. So they, they varied in exactly the same fashion as the ones that we see in the Milky Way, but they're much fainter. And this was the first indication of an, that our universe was really big, that, it was, that there were objects that were well beyond the scope of the Milky Way. And, and so this is, it's, it kind of was the first object that was proven to be extragalactic, the first galaxy to be recognized. Uh, and you know, Andromeda is still a cornerstone object. Um, and to start this talk, I wanted to just kind of uh, uh, show you this movie that shows how, with new observations, we're able to you know, prove that all of these, this milky light that you're seeing is actually made up of lots of individual stars. But also, more importantly, that how we can use uh, new data for, of this galaxy to kind of restore its position as a kind of cornerstone object in our understanding of the universe. Um, and so this is a, a ground-based image, a lovely ground-based image from uh, Robert Gendler. And then this is switching to some of the data I'm going to be talking about. It's a Hubble Space Telescope image uh, of one section of this very bright star-forming region in uh, Andromeda. And you can see that all of that fuzz uh, resolves into millions of individual stars uh, and groups of stars that are star clusters. And that's what I'm going to be talking to you today about the individual stars and star clusters that we can see in Andromeda. All right. So why do we want to look at Andromeda? We want to look at Andromeda because we want to understand how galaxies form. And uh, I wanted to kind of discuss, there's people who study galaxy formation in all different ways in astronomy. And I kind of wanted to put this work in, that, in context. Um, and one way that people study galaxies is they take as deep of images or spectra as they can of objects, and they find the most distant galaxies they can, and they say, OK, you know, a billion years after the Big Bang, this is what galaxies look like. Two billion years after the Big Bang, this is what galaxies look like. And they look at how galaxies evolve that way. OK? But the problem with that, I mean, there, there's lots of things that we've learned from that. But one problem with that is that, or two problems with that is that, one, we can really only study the kind of the stuff that becomes the most massive galaxies in the universe this way. The, the, and galaxies, even like the Milky Way, are very difficult to understand their formation in this way. The other thing about uh, studying, studying galaxies in this kind of time-stepped way is that we don't have any way of connecting the galaxies that we see in today's universe with the galaxies that are in uh, the distant universe. Not no way, but it's difficult to do. Jung works on, on how you do that kind of connection in part. Um, so another way that people study galaxies is they, uh, they use computers. They use computer simulations. And they use as their initial conditions the, uh, the, the observations of the cosmic micro ba microwave background radiation, which tell us the temperature and density of material in the early universe. And then they evolve that stuff forward, assuming a bunch of dark matter as well. And they, uh, and they look at what happens to form galaxies. And 
Um, I've worked on these kinds of simulations myself in graduate school. Uh, and they're, they've told us a lot about how galaxies form. In particular, you can see one of the major things that has come out of, out of this kind of analysis is that galaxy formation is hierarchical. Galaxies are built up of lots of smaller building blocks. Um, but a big weakness of this kind of prescription is that when you're actually trying to look at the detailed properties of galaxies, the resolution of these simulations is really not sufficient to capture the physics that happens to form, to turn gas into stars, especially. And for the, how those stars feed back on their, their gas. And that is captured if you just, this simulation, which is a fairly high resolution version of a simulation, uh, these kinds of simulations, has individual particles in it that are 30,000 times the mass of our sun. And so you can't just form one star, you have to form 30,000 at once. And, and, figuring, and they use some kind of prescription to do that, but figuring out a prescription that's kind of universally applicable in all sorts of situations is extremely challenging. And so, uh, Question? yes? Can all galaxies ro uh, rotate in the same sense? I mean, like this one, rotating in a particular sense, or do you find a, a, a different sense? Yeah, you find they, they're, they're essentially random. It's, it's by the, the, the rotation is due to the torques from neighboring halos in the early universe. So there's no, there's no preferred direction in the universe. Yeah. <laughs> Except at, uh, looking right towards us, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> so nearby galaxies uh, are uh, another way to study galaxy histories. And the, the way that we study galaxy histories and what I'm going to be talking to you about today is that we directly observe those galaxy histories by looking at individual stars whose ages and compositions we can infer. Uh, and you can see this is not Andromeda. This is another nearby galaxy I've worked on. Uh, and uh, you can see that you know, just like Andromeda, it resolves into many individual stars and clusters of stars. And those objects can be easily or relatively easily age dated, and then we can figure out the history of the galaxy by kind of just building up the history of all the stars. So you might think, OK, so let's look at nearby galaxies. Why don't we just spend all our time looking at the Milky Way? And because it's the nearest galaxy, we should be able to see it in unprecedented detail. And that's true, and a lot of people do look at the Milky Way. Um, but the Milky Way has several challenges for us understanding the kind of overall formation history. One of them is that. Measuring distances to objects in the Milky Way is very, very difficult. You, when you look at an object, you, have to, uh, you don't really know its distance, typically. And only a small fraction of all the objects are close enough to measure by parallax. And so, um, and so distances are an issue. Another issue is that what we're looking at right here is actually the center of our galaxy. X marks the spot here. That's the very center of our galaxy. And we look in optical wavelengths, which is where stars emit most of their light and where we can learn most about their, uh, their ages and compositions, we, can't, uh, we, we just can't study the center of our galaxy that way. And we can't study large sections of our galaxy that way. We can only really study our local solar neighborhood. And so um, this is why we turn to studying Andromeda, uh, because it's a galaxy, large galaxy like our own Milky Way. And, uh, and it can serve as kind of a template for us understanding both galaxy formation and kind of star formation on galaxy-wide scales. Uh, and so, so I'm going to be talking about the project that, we, um, that, that me and many collaborators of mine have been working on over the last few years called the Panchromatic Hubble Andromeda Treasury Survey. Uh, this is a, uh, was a kind of unique opportunity in the, the Hubble Space Telescope's history. There was a, one chance where they allowed people to propose for many year uh, large proposals that would take many years rather than a single year uh, to, to, to finish. And this happened in uh, the call for proposals in 2009. And there was 39 proposals. And we were one of three successful proposals uh, as, uh, in, that, in that round. Um, and we were awarded 828 orbits, which is how they allocate their time of Hubble Space Telescope time. That's about two months total of time. Each orbit's about 90 minutes. And we got that this over about three years, this data over about three years. Um, and what we've done is not take images just in one, one filter, but we've taken data in six filters uh, from the UV through near-infrared wavelengths. Um, and we've collected about 90 billion pixels of data. So uh, we've imaged about a third of the galaxy. The, that white outline shows 
our kind of crazy footprint that we have. Um, and you can see that it extends from the center of the galaxy all the way out to its kind of uh, optical radius. And uh, the, although there's, there's faint stars, lots of stars way beyond this radius too, but a majority of the light is within this area that we're, uh, that we're looking at. And the equivalent position of the sun is shown as an X. So we're really covering a large range of, of the galaxy's radius so that we can kind of study how it formed as a function of radius. Um, and this total imaging area is about 65 by 15,000 light years, or in more astronomer units, it's about 20 by 5 kiloparsecs. Um, so the main science goals uh, that, of this proposal were to study the formation history of Andromeda and to understand star and star cluster formation in kind of a galaxy-wide context in Andromeda. Um, and these, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about both of these topics uh, today. Um, and the survey design and initial results were published last year. Uh, and we've had about seven refereed papers so far. There's lots and lots of work going on. Uh, many submitted papers, many papers in preparation. And lots and lots of pretty pictures to look at. OK, so my role in this is that uh, I, I'm leading the team cluster collaboration. So I'm focusing the, the group of, that's focusing on the star clusters in this data. And I'll be talking a lot about that. Um, this is a sub-collaboration with about uh, 23 participants from uh, 11 institutions worldwide. Um, there's, we're, I'm also going to tell you a little bit at the end about stellar population mapping, which is the idea of taking stars of different ages and compositions and looking at where they live in the galaxy. So kind of a history, history of the galaxy, map, historical maps of the galaxy. Um, our observing strategy, I just, I'm not going to spend too long on this, but our observing strategy was to tr try taking advantage of uh, the fact that you can take images in multiple cameras simultaneously on the Hubble Space Telescope. Uh, and to do that, we divided our imaging area into, this, uh, into bricks, 23 little bricks. Each brick had 18 different pointings by the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. That's what's shown in the upper right there. And there was, we, observed, uh, each, we observed each pointing with three different cameras, two on the Wide Field Camera 3 instrument uh, in the, at UV and IR wavelengths. Um, and uh, one with, and, and the pointing is also with, in, at visible wavelengths with the advanced camera for surveys. The Wide Field Camera 3 was the uh, camera that was put on in the last, uh, the last servicing mission of Hubble. Um, and uh, the filters that we're using are, have these kind of names that are, are not very uh, informative to most people. Uh, so I thought I would just show you where they lie in wavelength space. So this is wavelength in angstroms. An angstrom is uh, 10 angstroms is one nanometer for those of you who don't normally use astronomy units. Uh, but you can see there's UV, optical, and infrared red wavelengths. And the reason why we, we chose these filters was to capture, to be able to characterize the temperatures and compositions of a large range of stars, from very, very hot stars to very, very cool stars. And so what's shown on the bottom panel here are, are spectra of Vega, which is about 10,000 degrees. Uh, our sun, which is about 6,000 degrees, and a star that's more like 3,000 degrees. And you can see that as the, just as you expect from a black body, the, the wavelength shifts towards redder wavelengths at, uh, at cooler temperatures. And so to characterize stars of a wide range of temperatures, we need a, a wide range of filters. Um, so here's our current survey status. And I've been giving this talk a few times. And this is the first time I've been able to put done on the current survey status. We just finished uh, our observations in August. Um, and uh, this, the little green chaos there is every single exposure with the, uh, with the telescope. Um, and uh, there's actually two exposures that failed during this time that will be retaken in October. But, uh, but basically, we're done. So uh, we finally just, just have the, all the data in hand, and we can kind of go forward with all of our science. OK, so to give you a sense of what this data looks like, it's really, you know, its resolution is really amazing, as I hopefully you saw in the, the movie. But this is the center of the galaxy. Um, and the, you can see, uh, if we zoom in to kind of a full resolution area, that the, the, the central star fields are incredibly dense. 
they're, we can't actually see stars, faint stars in these, not because they don't send us enough light, but because they're being uh, overlapped by brighter stars. So we're con what's called confusion limited in this area. And you can also see there's, there's groups of stars like these. These are uh, massive clusters of stars. They're called globular clusters. They're uh, what uh, Innes Ivans works on, although in our own galaxy. Um, if we go towards the outer part of our survey, you can see at low resolution, the, the, the fields look almost blank. But they're, in a, they're very far from being blank. Uh, we, when we zoom in, you can see that there's still lots and lots of individual stars. Uh, and in addition to things like background galaxies, this is a foreground star in our own Milky Way. Um, and the real power of this survey is taking all of these stars and measuring how bright they are in each of our filters. A question. Yes. How do you know which of these is uh, star in Andromeda versus some distant star that's lower brightness from our own galaxy? Yeah, so it's a good question. It's, I, I can tell you that this one for sure is a foreground star. Uh, we do have foreground stars in our in the data, uh, and we there are there are cuts that we can make at, based on their brightnesses in different filters that allow us to filter most of those out. Uh, and but there's they're really small compared to the total number of 100 million. We have about 100 million stars in our survey, and the total number of foreground stars is probably only about 10,000 or so. So it's really really they're really a small number of them. Um, so we, we find if we just measure the brightnesses of all the stars, we can detect more than 100 million stars. This is, uh, for context, this is uh, more than 30% of the stars in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which uh, Utah is uh, very active in, um, and is a, you know, a major project that's really revolutionized our understanding of our galaxy as well as other galaxies. Um, and the, uh, what we can do with the, the first way that we look at our data is to take the brightnesses of these stars and plot them as a function of their color in some, one of our filter band passes. And um, this is really just a ratio of the brightness in these two filters. Uh, and you can see that they don't fall everywhere in this diagram. They fall in distinct patterns. And um, to give you a, a sense of what these, what these patterns are, this is a, a, an equivalent model color magnitude diagram where we've taken stellar evolution models and uh, assumed a constant star formation rate, that uh, something was forming stars for constantly over the entire age of the universe. And, uh, and this, is, this is what you would expect to see with where it's been convolved with the errors of our data as well. And so you can see that uh, they're color coded by their age, where blue is young and red is old. And you can see that in general, blue stars fall are young and red stars are, are old. Okay, so the, the stuff that's on that side of the diagram typically tends to be old stars. The oldest stars, the ones on this side of the diagram, tends to be the youngest stars. And the, there's some distinct features that I'm going to be talking about so that I want to introduce you to. This is the main sequence of stars, this plume of blue stars. These are stars like our sun that are burning hydrogen into helium, but these are much more massive than our sun. They're much more luminous than our sun. These are stars. We can see stars about two times the mass of our sun and brighter as, when they're on the main sequence. Um, and these stars that you're seeing up here are probably 10, 15 times the mass of our sun. Uh, and so these young main sequence stars are, are one feature that we can see. Another feature that we can see are these old stars over here. These are called red giant branch stars. So a star like our sun isn't, uh, isn't bright enough to see. But as it ages, it's going to go through some crazy uh, uh, stellar evolution stuff that's going to happen to it. It's going to inflate. It's an enormous size, become very luminous as it's burning hydrogen in a shell around its core. And that is the red giant branch phase. So we can probe stars that are very old by looking at these evolved stars. But in general, we know really, we really well understand how this part of stellar evolution works, whereas this part is a little bit harder to characterize and it's a little bit harder to, um, to quantify the history of of stars based on their positions in, in that part of the color magnitude diagram. So young, at young ages, we can really measure the history of the galaxy really well. At old ages, we can't measure it quite as well. But we can still try measuring. Um, so this is how we take a color magnitude diagram and turn it into what we call a star formation history. So just the number of stars that formed at different epochs. So we just take some field, we plot up all its stars on a color magnitude diagram, and then we bin that color magnitude diagram we bin a bunch of stellar model color magnitude diagrams. We do a best fit. 
and we get a, uh, a, um, a star formation history. And, and in this field, there are some, some stars, the very brightest blue stars can only be, have to have been formed very recently because they only live a very short amount of time, whereas the less massive stars formed maybe 50 or 100 million years ago. And then the older stars are not modeled in this, in this, uh, in this data. So we can basically the idea is just that we can take the individual stellar data, and we can turn it into star formation history information. So I'm going to be talking to you mostly about star clusters. Star clusters are groups of uh, stars that all formed at the same time and they've remained gravitationally bound since their birth. Um, this is uh, this picture hopefully gives you a sense of why we might want to study star clusters in our data. If when we take a ground-based image, this is actually from a four meter telescope, so bigger than Hubble, take a ground-based image, it just, the, these, this star cluster just looks like a blob. But when we take an HST image, which is above the blurring effects of the atmosphere, we can see many, many individual stars. And uh, this is what it looks like in each of our filters, the image in each of our filters. Uh, and this is what a color magnitude diagram of this looks like. And the thing that makes star clusters really good is because they are all born at the same time. If we just take one star out of our survey, we can't, it's difficult to know exactly what its age is. But if we have a whole collection of stars, we can really age date it very accurately. And so that's one of the reasons why star clusters are so interesting uh, in our survey. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why we care about star clusters uh, for other reasons too. So first, you know, they're easy to age date, and that means that we can study the galaxy history. We can figure out when the major epochs of formation were in the galaxy's history. Um, and we can actually use this to test stellar evolution. There's phases of stellar evolution that are very rare. They happen very quickly as stars evolve towards the end of their lives. And uh, by knowing what the age of the overall stellar population that is there is, we can figure out how, what their, those lifetimes are. But what I'm going to be talking to you more about today is um, studying star formation kind of on a galaxy-wide scale uh, with star clusters. Um, and there's a few things that I'm going to talk about. The fraction of stars that are formed in bound clusters, the mass function of clusters, how many masses, clusters there are of different masses, and this, the stellar initial mass function, how many stars of different masses within a cluster do we find. And these are all interesting, uh, these are all, uh, interesting things to learn to help us tell us about star formation, which isn't a very well understood process theoretically. It allows us to take, uh, hopefully improve the simulations kind of uh, prescriptions for how we turn gas into stars and how we study galaxy formation. So I'm just going to go through uh, each of these points just to uh, tell you what we're hoping to learn and then I'm going to talk about their star clusters and what we've learned. So the, the first thing is the cluster formation efficiency. This is just the fraction of stars that end up making one of these star clusters. Um, and we parameterize this with gamma. Uh, and here's a plot where gamma is in percentage. And you can see one of the interesting findings that has happened over the last decade is that we found that, uh, that as you get more and more rapid star formation, you find a higher and higher fraction of those stars end up in star bound star clusters. And so if you go to something that's star bursting, like those green data points up there, those are things that are forming stars at a much more rapid rate than the Milky Way is, then you get a, almost you get a large fraction of all your stars forming in star clusters. But when you go down to uh, things that are just puttering along, forming a few stars, you get many fewer star clusters. And this isn't isn't well understood theoretically at all. And it's the kind of question that is uh, kind of the the kind of question of how gas turns into stars on galaxy-wide scales. This is a constraint on that problem. And uh, and this is actually, the, the plot is from a theoretical paper that's trying to advance one model. Um, and it includes data points from uh, a paper that I wrote with a graduate student at the University of Wyoming uh, last year. OK. Uh, and then another question, kind of related question, is do all massive stars form in star clusters? And massive stars are really important in astronomy because they are the things that generate all of the heavy elements that make up you and me and the planets. Uh, and they're also the, the light that we see in a distant galaxy is almost all coming from massive stars. And so if we want to understand uh, how, how galaxies form, we really also need to understand how massive stars form. And 
it turns out that this question, do all massive stars form in star clusters, is a question that can distinguish between existing theories of star formation. There's two kind of competing camps. One says, yes, you can form massive stars anywhere. You just have enough gas to form that star. Others say, no, you really need a really big reservoir of gas to draw from in order to form a massive star. And there's also a controversy observationally uh, whether any isolated young massive stars have been found. Um, and that's because you know, we can find stars that are not in clusters, massive stars that are not in clusters. But what we, when we look at them, we see things like this. So these are images of massive stars in our own Milky Way um, taken in narrow band. And we're look narrow band light that is an emission line. We're looking at gas around those, uh, around those stars. And what you can see is that all of them are moving really quickly relative to their surroundings. And this, is a, this suggests that they were ejected from their star clusters and their, uh, through dynamical processes. And so all the isolated, it's been argued that all the isolated stars that we see are actually just uh, formed in clusters and ejected. Uh, question. Yeah. So what's your definition of a cluster? I mean, how far apart do the stars have to be to be quote, in a cluster? Yeah, so they have to be gravitationally bound in the tidal field of the galaxy. So, so the galaxy will rip apart a cluster because of its tidal field if it remains gravitationally bound. And it'll change over time. A cluster can dissolve. So typically, how big are these clusters? They're um, a few light years across, like a 10 light years across. It would be the uh, effective radius. Half, half the light would be in there. OK, so um, the last thing, uh, or yeah, no, what, the, the, another thing we can study is the mass of the mass spectrum of clusters. So this is the number of clusters that form at different masses uh, in, a, in a galaxy. And this, in general, people have looked at distant galaxies to study this because it's very difficult to get large numbers of mass estimates in our own Milky Way. Um, and that has restricted them to looking at very massive clusters. This is 100,000 times the mass of the sun. And what they find is, in general, there's more less massive clusters and fewer very massive clusters. Uh, and that power, the, this is typically described as a power law, and that power law index uh, is, is very similar to the power law index of, of the masses of gas clouds. And so it's been suggested that you know, this is just a, a translation of gas into stars, and they're translating into these clusters. Um, and so uh, one of the things, of, the goals of our project is to really extend this measurement down to much lower masses to see if that process continues happening efficiently at lower masses. Um, and finally, the, the initial mass function of stars within a cluster, that's just the mass of individual stars within a star cluster, how many, of masses, uh, how many stars of different masses there are. So, and, it, and just like with clusters, we find that if you form one really massive star, you're also going to form hundreds of less massive stars. Uh, and so that's normally characterized by a power law with this uh, uh, minus alpha power law, and alpha is found to be about 2.4 or so. Um, but there's, there's actually a lot of modern observations which are suggesting that this varies as a function of environment. And so that's something that we want to study in our, uh, in our data. OK, so in order to, uh, in order to study the star cluster population, we need to first find those star clusters. And so when we got our first data uh, back in uh, 2010, we, uh, we looked through it. We got a team of eight people, and we individually looked through all of the data, uh, thousands of pixels, thousands of images, and spent about a month each of our time going through and uh, circling every star cluster. We actually created a program on the cloud. Everyone logged into the cloud. and Anyway. Uh, and uh, we made a catalog. We measured how bright they were. And uh, that was published in 2012. And this was our first years of data. And the thing that we found was we found lots of new clusters. We have almost a tenfold increase in the number of clusters uh, that we found in this area versus what was previously known. And this is a plot that just shows the dim clusters are over here, bright clusters are over here. The red line shows all the previously known ones. The black line shows our data. So you can see we're finding many, many less massive clusters. Um, but we didn't really want to spend another you know, four or five months of our lives looking through images. Even though they're really pretty, that gets pretty boring. So we were faced, faced with this problem. How do we extend this to the full data set? 
we tried working on computer algorithms to select the clusters, and that really doesn't, doesn't work very well. And the reason why is that clusters have a really, really varied appearance as a function of age. They can, they can also be very spread out or very clumped. And, and so it's very hard to design an algorithm that will select out lots of all the clusters with high completeness without getting tons of false positives. Um, so we converged on a solution, which was uh, the Andromeda project. And this was a, what's called a citizen science project, um, which may not be a familiar term to you, but it's basically trying to draft unpaid <laughs> citizens to do your dirty work for you. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so, uh, so we collaborated with some people who've been doing this for a while, the Zooniverse crew. They run a, 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 they, their first website was something called Galaxy Zoo, and now they have a, really, a real zoo of projects. They have um, projects that range from history uh, to the African safari, it's crazy. You can, uh, they have all kinds of things that you can spend your time on rather than going to Facebook. Um, so we were trying to, we drafted people to come to this website uh, and look at images and just circle uh, all the images that they, uh, all the clusters they saw in any given image. And we gave them a short tutorial and then just let them loose. And um, this proved to be uh, phenomenally successful. Uh, we had more than a million images viewed in 16 days, and that's when we decided to stop collecting data because we already had as much data as we needed. We had more than 80 people looking at every image and clicking on those images. Um, and this is our map of our users. Uh, the people in the middle of Russia weren't actually there. That's just the generic IP address somewhere in Russia. <laughs> Same with Canada. <laughs> there's, not, there's not a secret, secret uh, stash of citizen scientists up on the Hudson Bay. <laughs> but there is a secret stash of citizen scientists in Salt Lake City. So in this metric, uh, you know, which is measurement of how many users we had uh, as a function of position, Salt Lake City is comparable or greater than the great metropolises of our country. So, uh, and that was thanks to a lot of press coverage uh, that we had uh, on, this, on this project. Um, so, uh, my undergrad uh, student, Matt Wallace, who's been working on this project, um, made uh, a really great video that just shows what people did when they were on this website. And you can see, in general, they did what we asked them to do. They circled uh, the clusters, the star clusters in our images. And, uh, and so the white circles here are things that they, the people clicked as clusters. We also gave them the option of calling something a galaxy. Uh, and so the green circles are galaxies. Um, and you can see that, you know, in general, people were circling uh, clusters. And remember that 80 people looked at every one of these images. So if one, just one person circled something, that means only one out of, 70, uh, one out of 80 people uh, did that. But you can see, you know, when you have a nice cluster, most people uh, observe, uh, circled it. But some people also just circled every single bright star in the image, you know. <laughs> awesome. Thanks. <laughs> OK, so how are we going to you know, turn this into science? We want to take this, this citizen clicks. We want to take all these clicks, and we want to turn them into a sample of star clusters in our galaxy. Um, and so the way we do that is we take, you know, we have an image. We take all the circles on this image, uh, all the clicks on this image, and we just kind of boil them down into a number, which is the fraction of people that viewed that image that clicked on it. OK, and that's what's the, the number is shown here. We also sometimes, I'm going to use both view frac, which is the fraction of people that clicked on it, or cluster frac, which is the fraction of people that clicked on it that called it a cluster. Uh, and you can see those numbers range you know, from 73% or 83% for that thing up there in the corner uh, to kind of lower things for things that don't look so, uh, so amazing. So the question is, does this work? right? And so we, to test that, we included all of our data from our year one sample, which we had expert astronomers uh, look through. Uh, and um, this, is, this is the comparison, that if we just make a simple cut on if 35% of people or more called something a cluster, it's a cluster, this is what we get. We get that we find 90% of all of the star clusters in our year one sample. And we get also about 18% or so of contaminants. So that's pretty good. Like our best algorithms got three times the number of contaminants as they got clusters. So humans beat machines in this case. 
And in fact, a lot of these contaminants may not be real contaminants. They may be uh, kind of ambiguous objects, of which some we also have in our, in our, ca our own catalog, ambiguous objects which um, are, hard to, are hard to decide whether they're a cluster or not. So uh, I think we're, we're doing pretty well. Um, and as a way of quantifying how well we're doing, we also included a bunch of synthetic clusters, where we just created a, a fake cluster as realistically as we could, uh, and um, you know, distributing the stars as you would expect them based on stellar models, uh, and in a profile that you'd expect to see, the, see them uh, motivated by our initial observations. Um, and you can see that example here. Here's a star field, and then here's a star field plus a pretty bright uh, synthetic cluster. And what's shown over on here is the completeness, so the fraction of clusters found uh, at these different masses as a function of the mass of the cluster that we inserted. And so if you remember, before we were looking at, when we were looking at distant galaxies, we were looking at clusters that were tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands of times the mass of our sun. Here, with, with the data that we're getting here, we can getting down to 50% completeness at about 400 times the mass of our sun. So this is really uh, excellent. Um, and uh, that 50% completeness doesn't vary a lot depending on where we draw exactly this threshold of wh what we call a cluster or not. Um, so one thing that these synthetic clusters also showed us was that there was a really interesting bias that happened. And that's that was a distraction bias. And this is a bias that probably affected us real uh, professional people as well as the uh, average citizen scientists. Uh, and, and you can see the, the um, up here there's two fairly clear clusters. Uh, and then we stuck in a synthetic cluster that just happened to land right smack dab between them. And this is what happened. The cluster fractions went from about 80% down to 50 or 60%. Okay, so that is our distraction bias. And we have actually a way of quantifying this. Um, this is just, it turns out that it depends on how close the cluster was and how bright it was. So if it's a bright cluster and it's really close, it's going to have a large uh, distracting uh, effect. If it's distant and uh, faint, it won't. And we're actually um, trying to get a little bit better data. We're going to have a second round of data collection on October 5th, starting on October 15th. And we're hoping to get, we're designing an experiment to kind of measure this better, especially in particular when we have multiple distracting clusters, what the effect of multiple clusters is. That's something Matt's been working on. Um, another way that we can improve beyond just taking a flat, uh, you know, just 35% of people that found something, we call it a cluster, is we can actually try getting rid of all those people who just circled every darn star in the image, okay? And the way, we're gonna, the way we're doing that is kind of assuming that overall the wisdom of the masses prevails. So if 50% if, uh, of, of people identified something as a cluster, we call that a good cluster. And then we look at each user's fraction of the good clusters that they saw that they ID'd. And you can see that's what's shown on this axis. And then we also looked at what, uh, what the average view frac, so the average number of people that clicked on uh, the, all the things that that user clicked on. That's what's shown on this axis. And you can see, if you think about it for a little while, you can figure out that people who are really conservative, who only clicked on the most obvious clusters, they hardly clicked on, you know, they clicked only on a small fraction of the good clusters, but they only clicked on really, really awesome ones. Those are going to end up in the upper left corner. And people who are really liberal and just kind of going here and there, uh, just circling everything, those guys end up down here. They have on average, their cl clicks had very low quality, but they, s they found everything, <laughs> right? And of course, the best place to be is, is up there in the upper corner. That little circle actually is uh, the grad student Cliff who was working on this figured out who he was. That's him. <laughs> He's pretty awesome. It's not, it's not often that you get to measure yourself so directly against people, right? <laughs> I, I did not figure out where I, where I was. We actually, all the data was anonymous. He went over Christmas to his house in Maine. He knew the IP address there, and he was able to track down his username from there, <laughs> uh, his, his identity from there. OK, so this was our year one sample. This is just making a kind of a simple cut. We're improving on this right now. But uh, it looks like we're going to have something like 3,000 star clusters. In, in our, and that's without doing our second round of data collection. And this is already the largest sample of star clusters known in any galaxy, including our own Milky Way. And so this is a really, uh, a really powerful new tool for studying 
uh, star clusters and star formation. Um, and it's also a tenfold increase over the previously known star cluster population. All right, so here's the results. Uh, it, in order to get two results from our data, we need to derive ages and masses. And to do that, we need to know what things should look like as a function of age and mass. And so for that, we use stellar models. Um, and we can use the overall color and luminosity of the clusters uh, to estimate their ages and masses. And this is the joint probability distribution of our entire sample here as a function of log age and log mass. So you can see we have lots of clusters that are around 100 million years old that are about 1,000 times the mass of our sun. Um, we also have, we have many ways of determining the age. And this is really important because it's actually, this is a pretty thorny problem. Uh, we can also use the individual resolve stars in the data, especially for the youngest clusters. Um, and then we also have uh, spectra for about 500 star clusters from uh, Keck, and I'm sorry, I'm, this is a typo, Keck and the MMT telescope. These are 10 meter and a six and a half meter ground-based telescopes, which we can use to get spectroscopy of these data. Um, so here's the first, first of the results. This is our mass function. Once we've gotten the mass of all clusters, we can look at what how many clusters of different masses we see. Uh, and, and also, we can look at how that varies uh, across the galaxy. And this is really the most interesting part of this. Because we have such large number samples, we can start studying how this varies as a function of environment. And so if you look at this region here, which is called the 10 kiloparsec ring, that's the most active star-forming part of Andromeda. And it turns out that it looks like the mass function of that region is, is significantly shallower. There's more massive clusters relative to the number of less massive clusters than the uh, other regions. OK? And we'll look, see, find that this is odd in other ways. The, yeah? That's the, this is just this is the distribution of masses of the clusters, that's not right. the stars within the clusters. That's right. Okay. Thanks for clarifying that. So this is the distribution of the number of clusters as a function of their cluster mass. Oh, yeah, so the minus 2 was kind of that typical line that we see. And you can see they, they fall on either side of that line. So if you average it all together, you get something like minus 2. Any difference uh, between the previous known mass function? Uh, yeah, so, so any difference between previously known ones and this one? Well, uh, one thing is that we're, we're really exploring a different mass range than previous data has. Um, and then, uh, we're, you know, like I said, we can actually try uh, resolving where, how this varies as a function of position in the galaxy. And that's critical for understanding what the physical drivers of this uh, mass function are. Like if we can understand the, um, how gas pressure or uh, gas temperature varies, if that's, we can kind of compare these uh, mass functions to different key parameters and try understanding you know, uh, what regulates this uh, cluster formation. Yeah. Yeah, that's right. That? Uh, well, it was for number statistics reasons. Yeah. Like it looks like you're mixing two different so I, I, we originally did all three. Uh, and then uh, the two outer and inner regions, they turned out to be very similar in the probability distribution functions. And then we combined them to get better number they're statistics. The same yeah, they were, they were, their, their individual distributions were the same as this, but they were broader because there was poorer number statistics. All right, so uh, here's, this, here's the cluster formation efficiency analysis. So that was just looking at the mass of clusters. Now we're trying to look at how efficiently gas turns itself into clusters versus just stars that are distributed. Um, and what we're doing is we're, again, assessing. This was actually based on our year one data set. We're assessing the cluster fraction in the last 10 to 100 million years in these three star-forming regions. Um, this, the, this is a UV image, so it's just highlighting the very bright star-forming recent uh, young stars that have formed. Um, and the, the, there's a zoom in of the inner, middle, and outer regions. And we're looking at these kind of uh, red uh, regions here. Um, and so remember that we can uh, take a color magnitude diagram like this one. So this is the brightness of each of the individual stars in that whole area. And then we can turn it into a star formation history. And so this is when that area formed stars, how rapidly it was forming stars as a function of time. And so the number of solar masses per year as a function of age. 
And you can see in this region, there was a burst of star formation 10 to 40 million years ago, and another one uh, about 30, 300 million years ago. <coughs> and this was selected to have a burst of recent star formation, and we did that because we want to look at where there's a lot of stars forming and a lot of star clusters available. And so we combined this with ages and masses of hundreds of star clusters in each region in order to derive this ratio of the, number, the mass in clusters to the total mass in stars formed. And that gives us our cluster formation efficiency. And so these outer and inner regions, again, are quite similar. They both have, you know, between 5 and 10% of their stars are forming in star clusters. This middle region is interesting. It's the most rapidly star forming region, but it falls uh, way below uh, the, the expectation uh, from the, the expectations. Um, and so we actually are, are working on interpreting this right now. Uh, Cliff is working on a paper that he sent me a draft of yesterday. So, um, yeah. So we have, we have several next steps. We want to compare these to measurements of gas characteristics, and we want to extend this to our full survey. Um, we initially, you know, we just started assembling our full cluster sample, so we can't do that until we have a good uh, full cluster sample. OK. Uh, another thing is, uh, another result that we're working on is, do massive stars ever form alone? Uh, and this is just an image of all of the clusters from the Andromeda project. Uh, and then the blue, the blue squares are stars that are, have masses more than 10 times the mass of our sun and are more than 50 parsecs or 150 light years away from one of those clusters. So these are candidate isolated objects. And here's what one of them looks like. It's a bright blue star amidst a bunch of red stars. Um, and this is work I'm doing with uh, Jordan Bulkley. Uh, an undergrad here. And um, we're getting, we have gotten spectroscopy already, um, and we're getting more spectroscopy from the Keck 10 meter and LBT 8 meter telescopes to derive their Doppler velocities of these stars. So if these stars are really just ejected from nearby clusters, we'd expect them in general to have very high velocities relative to the gas that's nearby them. And uh, that's initial results from just three, 30 stars that we already have spectroscopy for, as shown here. This is the velocity of those stars, the, the line of sight velocity from the Doppler shift, relative to the local gas velocity at the location of that star. And so you would expect these things to be close to zero if, uh, if they you know, form the, the typical dispersions of clusters that are very low, a few kilometers per second. And in fact, we're seeing quite a large spread. Um, and I think we're, we're going to try modeling this uh, with some kind of basic, easy models to, to look at how, what, whether the, it's consistent with a population of ejected stars. OK, and then uh, finally, this measuring the initial stellar initial mass function. Uh, we can take the number of stars at different luminosities, which translates into different masses. Um, we can actually use all of the filter information we have to get those masses. Uh, and then we can use that to assess in any one cluster what the, uh, what the likelihood, what the um, power law index of the uh, mass distribution of stars is. And that's, this is a probability distribution function of one of this star cluster. And you can see that it, it has, it's steeper. This is a, also another gamma, but it's, it's just alpha minus 1. So this is the expected slope, the typical slope that we see. This one happens to have fewer high mass stars and more low mass stars than we expect. And, but it's a very broad distribution. We can get the opposite uh, result as well when we look at another cluster. We get more high mass stars, less low mass stars than we expect. Uh, and, um, and so this is you know, clearly a challenging measurement to make. There's large errors on any individual measurement. But we have hundreds of star clusters that we can use for this purpose. And so we're going to take all of those individual probability distribution functions, add them together to get the best measurement that's ever been made for this very important distribution of massive stars. And it's, it's really important because it tells us a lot. It, when we look at a distant galaxy, if we want to infer the mass of what the galaxy is, we only see the brightest stars. If there's many fewer brighter stars being formed, then, uh, then we're going to infer a much lower mass than we should. Right? So this, this measurement is really important in all, a bunch of areas of astronomy. Um, and we're going to get a measurement to about uh, 0.1 in the power law index. Um, and we're going to be able to break this again into subsamples and compare, see if there's any variations uh, in different areas of the galaxy. OK, so uh, just a couple of last slides on mapping populations. 
we can take these color magnitude diagrams, the individual resolved stars in those color magnitude diagrams, and we can just take little boxes in those color mag magnitude diagrams and plot up where those stars live in the galaxy. So if I just take boxes like these, where you take young stars and old stars, and then I look at, make a density map of just as, as a function of position in the galaxy, where do the, how many stars are in each little bin, this is what I get. Young stars have this kind of live along these spiral arms. They form in dense molecular material and live along spiral arms. Old stars have diffused over time and form a nice smooth distribution. And so uh, one of the initial pieces of analysis we did with this data was to look at um, how well this fits to kind of a smooth, the, the old stars fit to kind of a smooth exponential model, which is what we typically see for, we see exponential disks in spiral galaxies. And so this is our data uh, on the top. And I've excluded the center of the galaxy because the center of the galaxy has a bulge component. Uh, that, that's a group of old stars that are moving kind of randomly, that aren't part of this exponential disk component. And, uh, and then I've also excluded another region there that I'll show you why in just a second. And this is our best fit model, exponential model. And this is the residuals, data minus model over data. And you can see right here, there's a really huge overdensity above this uh, simple exponential profile. And uh, this was a pretty interesting uh, result. Um, and you can see it's about uh, 40 or 50% above what we expect to see. Uh, the, the, level, the number of stars is 40, 50% higher than we expect. And if we, don't, if we do include this in the fit, then we get a, a way large underdensity out here. So uh, we think this is a real uh, overdensity. Um, it, it coincidentally happens to fall right on top of this really massive star forming region. Uh, and uh, this suggests a kind of interesting thing, which is that this bright star forming region isn't just something that's been happening for the last you know, 100 million years or something. It's been happening. There's some long-term uh, group of stars that's lived in that area, an over, a long-term overdensity, a dynamical overdensity in that area. And one, one really interesting possibility, intriguing possibility, is that, um, is that this is actually a dwarf galaxy which is merged with Andromeda, and all of its gas is, current, is forming a bunch of stars in this 10 kiloparsec ring that we see. And the, the core of its uh, old stellar population is sitting right where we're looking. And so that's something we're, we should be able to test with spectroscopy. Um, and we're looking forward to doing that. OK, and just one, uh, one last thing. Dylan Gregerson has been working uh, on trying to take this a step further, looking at old stars as a function of their composition. So not all old stars are the same. Some of them have a lot of heavy metals, which suggests many previous generations of star formation. Some of them have very few previous generations of star formation. These are the ones that are true kind of fossils of the early universe. And what we're doing is we're taking a look at uh, what the, the distribution for the first time. We're trying to look at what the distribution of these metal poor stars is uh, inside the, the uh, inside kind of close to the center of the galaxy. And we can use the spectroscopy data that we have from uh, the Keck telescope um, to look at uh, the distribution of stars that are in that blue bin and red bin. And you can see that many more of them have very negative velocities. And this is the velocity that we would expect from a, a system that's not rotating with the disk, but is instead um, uh, in just a hot system of stars. And so we're going to try combining these photometric and spectroscopic measurements to be able to map out these metal poor stars throughout the galaxy. OK, so in conclusion, that the survey is producing the largest and best characterized sample of star clusters known in any galaxy. Uh, the study of environmental dependence of the mass function and cluster formation efficiency will help us reveal the physical drivers of star formation, the stuff that will allow us to improve our models of how gas turns into stars on galaxy-wide scales, um, and resolved stars can be used to map out Andromeda's formation history. Okay, thanks. We just have a we have a cluster that we that we show them and we say you know go circle here go circle here and that's all and then we have a whole guide that people can look through for many many more examples so we don't force them to go through that uh, but they can they have reference to that and then there was also 
a social media aspect of this. There was a, a talk area where people could talk to each other. <laughs> and the science team also, you know, when people were circling things that were clearly not clusters, saying, oh, what is this? And we'd say, that's not a cluster. And we'd try feeding back that way. <laughs> so there's no, OK, so there's no, no way of saying. Well, I mean, in general, they tend to be it's groups of their gr no. It's not that's not true. They they tend to be groups of uh, of of resolved individual stars, and also they tend to have a milky light ba white background from all the fainter stars that we can't see that lie underneath those the the fainter stars that are than the ones that we're seeing. And so that uh, in general, if they had both of those characteristics, it's almost certainly a cluster, uh, and that's that's what we're looking for. Yeah. Yeah, in fact, lots of them have been identified. I think I have a slide here that shows. Uh, so this is Andromeda on a huge scale. So all of the things that we were talking about were just in that little central part that's a color picture there. And this is what the large scale of Andromeda looks like in terms of its stellar density. And almost all of these stars are old, uh, generally metal poor, meaning they don't have a lot of heavy element stars. And you can see that there's evidence for um, for, there might be some interaction. This is a neighboring galaxy, M33. This is probably a tidal tail here. Um, and, there's, and this thing right here is probably also a tidal feature as this galaxy is getting ripped out as it's going right through the middle of the galaxy. And this is the kind of stuff that we're hoping to find, but closer in to the center of the galaxy where the dynamical lifetimes are really short. So if we see anything, we know it's a very recent merger. Yeah, there's no evidence for a tail that we can see yet, but we're, we'll, uh, <laughs> we'll keep looking. <laughs> it's, it's very much in the brightest region of the galaxy, right? So it's, that makes it difficult. Is there any kinematic information to distinguish between a emerged dark galaxy there versus a foreground? Yeah, yeah. And, there's, I, and also the other thing about the kind of weird thing about the 10 kilobarstic ring is that it's actually off center from the original galaxy. So I think that through. I'm hoping that through a combination of kind of kinematic data and dynamical modeling, we can actually uh, we can actually distinguish between those scenarios. Yeah. Okay. So when you speak of gas, is it hydrogen or? Yeah, it's mostly hydrogen. Twenty-five percent helium, about two percent of other stuff. Yeah, it's it's and and it's normally the gas is multi-phase. It has a molecular component. Uh, that has carbon monoxide molecules, water molecules, that kind of thing. And then there'll be a neutral hydrogen component and then a very hot component. Um, so you said you were looking for massive stars that may have formed on their own. So yeah. one, is there any reason to expect that a massive star would be able to have enough gas to form on its own without other stars? Yeah. And two, is velocity the only thing you can test that just because how would you model something like you hope it can relax into the rotation of the galaxy? Yeah, yeah. So that's a, that's a, those are great questions. Uh, so yes, there are, there, there are competing theories of star formation, which uh, one suggests that you really do need a big reservoir of gas in order to have the type, the type of events that will form massive stars. And then uh, other, there's another competing uh, star formation theory, which suggests that all, you know, basically full clouds can collapse into a single star, and, and you'll, get, uh, you'll get that kind of star formation. Uh, and so, Yes, the, the, there, there's reason to expect that, that you might have isolated stars. And in fact, there's plenty of observational papers which say we found isolated stars. Um, so it's hard to, uh, right, if, if obviously we just have line of sight velocity, but in the galaxy, they actually have proper motions as well. So they have three dimensional velocities. So you can look at that uh, data. Um, but the, the advantage that we have is we have a statistically huge sample of, of objects. And so what I'm hoping is that our statistics can beat what? Uh, the individual, a bunch of individual test cases in our own galaxy. Okay. Well, let's thank our speaker again. That was great. Thank you so much for for uh, helping out with the. Yeah, I was going to ask the last question too. Oh yeah. yeah the, um, what is your resolution of it for a cluster? Uh, How many stars? What's your mass limit? Uh, so it's it's something like I mean I, I think a, 
there's an analysis we have to do kind of after we collect our stellar sample, which is how many of these objects look like they're bound objects, where we just take the mass, we take their radius, we look at, the, you know, and that, that tells us whether they should be bound or not. Um, and their age, and you know that. Um, but, so, uh, the mass, you know, we, we do expect to be able to see down to something like 400 solar mass objects or something like that. Yeah. So, um, you know, that's smaller than Orion or something. Uh, so, so you really should tiny. be able to see like a typical host cluster for a, a, a good Yeah, star. yeah, that's right. That's just really, really yeah. cool. It's so I, I don't think that, I think all the same theories that predict you can't form isolated stars also say that you need like, you know, a thousand solar masses or something like that. Yeah. Stuff forming around, because of the IMF, you know, the, it's so steep that yeah, you're going to have. Right. And this is, this is kind of why this is interesting. Another reason why this is interesting is there's this uh, Pavel Krupa, who, who's kind of, you know, a iconoclast. He has this IMF, it's called the IG, Integrated Galactic IMF Theory, which is that you, you're, you're, if you don't fully sample the, the clusters in your, your, you'll effectively have a, a, a lower mass weighted IMF because you're going to not be able to ever form those most massive stars in a lower mass galaxy. Right. And so that has a lot of consequences for, you know, like dwarf galaxy enrichment and all that stuff. Uh, and so that's one of the, actually the primary motivations for doing this kind of work. Is that, yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah. That's great. Cool. Actually, if you have, um, you know, I mean, I, you have no time probably, but uh, Jordan, who's working with me on this project, I'd kind of be interested in having a dynamicist involved, um, just as kind of maybe just you know, once every couple months we could meet and just talk about what we've done and sure, way, see if you have any ideas on okay. the stuff that we could do. Um, yeah, we might want to talk to Ben Kaya also. Okay. Because he. You know, he from, uh, Is that how you say his name? I think so. Okay. <laughs> I should. But